And now for the first story in our series of ghost stories by E. Nesbitt, The Shadow. It had been one of those jolly, old-fashioned Christmas dances where nearly everybody stays the night. There were three of us sharing a room, and in our surroundings of bright chintz, candle flame and firelight, we had talked of ghosts. Well, we none of us actually believed in ghosts, of course, but my heart at least seemed to leap to my throat and choke me there when a tap came to our door. A tap faint, not to be mistaken. Who's there? I asked, somewhat hesitantly. I give you my word, the instant of suspense that followed is still reckoned among my life's least confident moments. Almost at once, the door opened fully, and Miss Eastwich, my aunt's housekeeper, companion and general standby, looked in on us. She shivered a little. <laughs> so did we. For in those days corridors were not warmed by hot water pipes, and the air from the door was keen. I saw your light, she said at last, and I wondered how she is. Her glance turned towards the door of the dressing room. Another girl, who had fainted suddenly during the dance, had been put to bed there. She's fast asleep, I said. I should have added a good night, but the other two, who were both younger than me, were already on their feet. Come in, the younger of them cried. Yes, come in, echoed the other. Come in and get warm. There's lots of cocoa left. They drew Miss Eastwich in and shut the door. We've been telling ghost stories, I explained. The worst of it is, we don't believe in ghosts. No one we know has ever seen one. All ghost stories are so beautifully rounded off, said Miss Eastwich. The most horrid ghost story I ever heard was one that was quite silly. The other two squealed with delight. Tell it! Oh, do tell it! I can't. There's really nothing to tell, Miss Eastwich said slowly. In fact, the only thing that I ever knew of was, was hearsay. She paused. Till just the end. I knew then that she would tell her story. And I knew too that she had never told it before. That she was only telling it now because she was proud. And this seemed the only way to pay for the fire and the cocoa and the company. Well, she said, it was more than twenty years ago now. I had two friends. And I loved them more than anything in the world. And they married each other. She paused, and I knew just in what way she had loved each of them. After they were married, I did not see much of them for a year or two. And then he wrote and asked me to come and stay, because his wife was ill, and I should cheer her up, and cheer him up as well, for it was a gloomy house, and he himself was growing gloomy too. Well... I went. The address was in Lee, near London. The house didn't look gloomy. It was a smart new villa, with iron railings and a brightly coloured tiled front path. Well, they were very glad to see me, and I was very glad to be there. She went to bed early and asked me to keep him company through his last pipe, so we went into the dining room and sat in the two armchairs on each side of the fireplace. He sat looking into the fire. Presently, he said, Margaret, this is a very peculiar house. He always called me Margaret. You see, we'd been such old friends. I told him I thought the house was very pretty and fresh and homelike. He said, it is new. That's just it. We're the first people who've ever lived in it. If it were an old house, I should think it was haunted. I asked if he had seen anything. No, he said, not yet. Heard then, said I. No, not heard either, he said. But something follows me about. Only when I turn round, there's never anything. Only my shadow. And I always feel that I shall see the thing next minute, but I never do. Not quite. It's always just not visible. "'Has Mabel seen or heard anything?' I asked. "'He shook his head. 
No, but I don't know when she may. And you know Mabel. She's like a little bird on a flower. You were always so sensible and strong-minded. I said yes, of course. Then he said he thought I could help him. And did I think anyone he had wronged could have laid a curse on him? And did I believe in curses? I said I didn't. And the only person anyone could have said he had wronged forgave him freely. I knew if there was anything to forgive. At first, when I began to notice things, I tried to think that it was his talk that had upset my nerves. It wasn't only at night, but in broad daylight. On the stairs and in passages, the feeling used to be so awful that I had to bite my lips till they bled to keep myself from running upstairs at full speed. One night, I went down to the kitchen to heat some milk for Mabel. The servants had gone to bed. As I stood by the fire, waiting for the milk to boil, I glanced through the open door and along the passage. There was a cupboard at the end of the passage, and the door was partly open. I said, Mabel? But not because I thought it could be Mabel who was crouching down there, half in and half out of the cupboard. The thing was grey at first, and then it was black. Then it seemed to sink down till it lay like a pool of ink on the floor, and then its edges drew in, and it flowed into the cupboard till it was all gathered into the shadow there. I saw it go quite plainly. I screamed aloud. But even then, I'm thankful to say, I had enough sense to upset the boiling milk, so that when he came downstairs three steps at a time, I had the excuse for my scream of a scalded hand. The explanation satisfied Mabel, but next night he said, "Why didn't you tell me?" It was that cupboard. All the horror of the house comes out of that. Tell me, have you seen anything yet? Or is it only the nearly seeing and nearly hearing still? I said, "Well, you must tell me first what you've seen." He told me, and what he had seen was what I had seen. After that, I hated to be alone with the shadow, because at any moment I might see something that would crouch and sink and lie like a black. Pool, and then slowly draw itself into the shadow that was nearest. Often that shadow was my own, and always I saw it with a straining of the eyes, as if my sight to see it had to be strained to the uttermost. And then, one morning, early, I heard it. It was close behind me, and it was only a sigh. It was worse than the thing that crept into the shadows. I couldn't have borne it if I hadn't been so fond of them both. But I knew in my heart that if he had no one to whom he could speak openly, he would go mad or tell Mabel. And the weeks went by, and Mabel's baby was born. The nurse and the doctor said that both mother and child were doing well. He and I sat late in the dining room that night. We had neither of us seen or heard anything for three days. Our anxiety about Mabel was lessened. We talked of the future. It seemed then so much brighter than the past. We arranged that the moment she was fit to be moved, he should take her away to the sea, and I should superintend the moving of their furniture into the new house he had already chosen. He was happier than I had seen him since his marriage, almost like his old self. When I said good night to him, he said a lot of things about my having been a comfort to them both. I hadn't done anything much, of course, but still, I am glad he said them. I went upstairs. As I passed Mabel's room, I listened at the door. Everything was quiet. I went on towards my own room, and in an instant, I felt that there was something behind me. I turned; it was crouching there. It sank, and as the black fluidness of it seemed to be sucked under the door of Mabel's room, I heard it sigh. I ran back, opened the door, and went in. The nurse and the baby were asleep. Mabel was asleep too. 
Oh, she looked so pretty, like a tired child. The baby was cuddled up into one of her arms with its tiny head against her side. I prayed then that Mabel might never know the terrors that he and I had known, that her ears might never hear any but pretty sounds, those clear eyes never see any but pretty sights. I did not dare to pray for a long time after that, because my prayer was answered. Mabel never saw, never heard, Anything more in this world? When they had put her in her coffin, I lighted wax candles round her, and I saw he had followed me. I took his hand to lead him away. At the door, we both turned. It seemed to us that we heard a sigh, and at that instant, we both saw it. Between us and the coffin, first grey, then black, it crouched an instant, then sank and liquefied, and was gathered together and drawn till it ran into the nearest shadow, and the nearest shadow was the shadow of Mabel's coffin. I left the next day. His mother came. She had never liked me. Miss Eastwich paused. I think she had quite forgotten us. Did you see him again? I whispered. Only once, Miss Eastwich answered, and something black crouched then between him and me. His second wife, crying beside his coffin. It's not a cheerful story, is it? I think it was seeing his daughter that brought it all back. She looked towards the dressing room door. The girl, I whispered, in there, is Mabel's baby. Yes, and she is exactly like Mabel, only with his eyes. Suddenly, Miss Eastwich leapt up, her eyes straining. She was looking at something that we could not see. That seemed not quite to reach the height of the dressing room door handle. Her eyes followed it down, down, widening and widening. Mine followed them, and did I quite see? I can't be certain, but we all heard the long-drawn, quivering sigh, followed by Miss Eastwich's dreadful, piercing cry as she caught up the candle. It dripped all over her trembling hand and staggered into the dressing room to the girl who had fainted during the dance, to Mabel's daughter. But it was too late. The doctor said that Mabel's daughter had died of heart disease, which she had inherited from her mother. It was that that had made her faint. But I have sometimes wondered whether she may not have inherited something from her father. I had never been able to forget the look on her dead face. The Shadow by E. Nesbit, abridged for radio by Roy Apps. Was read by Anna Maidley and produced by Celia De Wolf. It was a peer production for BBC Radio Four Extra.